Hey y'all, Coach and Friday guys, today it's Wim. Hey y'all. And in today's video, we're going to be talking about the 10 days of awe. Okay. These are the days between the memorial blowing the trumpets and atonement day. Yes. Many people don't know about these days. Right. Um, but they are significant days of repentance. Um, in fact, these days are what atonement is really all about. What atonement day is really all about. Mm -hmm. Because what we're going to learn here is that you make the announcement on the memorial of blowing the trumpets that these days have started. Mm -hmm. And then you start this 10 days where you go through reflection and repentance, ending with atonement, where you actually make atonement. So we're using Gad the Seer as our frame, as our backdrop. We're actually looking, we're going to be looking in chapter 14 of Gad the Seer. Right. And talking about other verses as we go to support or expound on what Gad was saying. Mm -hmm. And for anybody who are not familiar with Gad the Seer, this is one of the books that is mentioned in the Bible, but it's not actually in the Bible. Right. All right, so let's go ahead and let's look at verse one. Okay, verse one. And it came to pass on the first day of the seventh month at New Year's, in the 478th year after the children of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the second year of King Solomon's reign over Israel, I had a vision from the Lord when I was upon the Gihon spring. So this is Gad the seer. He's a prophet. That was what they used to call the prophets back in the old days with seers right. and so this is what seers do mm -hmm. okay and notice that it's talking about the first day of the seventh month right so that's the memorial blowing the trumpets which we find that in leviticus 23 um, verse 24 um, which tells us that that is a significant day we're supposed to uh, fast and we'll get a, into the rules of it you know, on, as we go but that's where we hear about today and its importance Mm -hmm. The historical insight talks about the Gihon Spring, which was a pivotal in Jerusalem history. It is associated with King Solomon's anointing, underscoring the vision's significance at a historical site. You can read about that in First Kings, verse one and thirty-three. So this is, if I'm understanding this correctly, is saying that this is the time when Solomon had his vision. Mm was during the memorial blowing the trumpets. And I also remember that Abraham, when he went out to look at the stars, remember mm -hmm. we did a class on that, where he actually was looking on that particular night. Okay. To, to get a uh, understanding of what was right. going to happen during the year. Yeah. And then even the keys of Enoch talks about this time. Yeah. Where a lot of people get these spiritual revelations and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. But again, that's talking about the memorial of blowing the trumpets. We mm -hmm. talk about that often when we talk about the gates of the inner court opening. Right. But let's look at verse two. And I raised my eyes and lo, the heavens rolled back like a scroll. And I saw the glory of the Lord sitting on an extremely high throne. Yeah. So he's having a vision similar to kind of like what John went through. Yeah, in Revelations, right. But let's look at verse three. And here's the appearance of the throne. Seven stairs led up to the throne, six of gold and six of silver. And there was a square back to the throne, like a sapphire stone. Now, this is all like what Ezekiel went through mm -hmm. when he saw the wheels within the wheel. Yeah. With similar splendor and symbology. But like it says in the biblical reference, it's also a reference to the temple is also symbolic of the temple. And the Zohar says, has something to add as well. It's talking about uh, divine governance. Mm -hmm. But we'll hear about that more when it gets into them, the verses that talk about these um, angels and what they're doing behind the scenes. Right. Let's look at verse four. And at its right side were three chairs, and at its left side were four chairs near the throne like the seven that see the king's face 
covered with gold and silver and precious stones. So this is referencing the same angels that we hear about in the Shepherd of Hermes or, or even um, the Book of Enoch. Mm -hmm. um, the, these are the governors over humanity at the time. Right. So the chairs, like it says, they represents the heavenly council or the divine court. Mm -hmm. Well, the biblical reference it gives is Daniel 7 and 9, with, which depicts thrones set for judgment. And, you know, when we think of, think of thrones, we automatically think of the seat of judgment. Yeah. So that's exactly who they are. Mm -hmm. Even in the book of Revelation, that's what they're talking about. Right. All right. Let's go on to verse five. And the glory of the Lord had the appearance like that of the rainbow, his covenant. Yeah, and then this is where I learned what the rainbow signifies. Mm -hmm. in, in, even in the book of Revelation, even uh, I think it mentions in here when we see the rainbow, uh, that's what it's talking about, the covenant. So when you see the rainbow return, it's talking about the return of the covenant. Yeah. You know, the rainbow now has been... Um, sort of use where people are somewhat ashamed of even, you know, I guess displaying, talking mm -hmm. about, mm -hmm. because it's being used in ways that are um, unholy. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Like the, the, um, um, the parades or whatever. Yeah. But mm -hmm. from what I understand, if you look closely, there's missing a color. It doesn't okay. have all of the colors of the rainbow. It's missing. Okay. Yeah. Right. So that's the difference in their flag. He said it's missing the color. Okay. All right. And, and you know, even if it wasn't, we still can't, you know, just say, well, I'm just going to throw that down. Even, if, you know, if it's something that oh, the yeah. father has, well, displayed as something good. Mm -hmm. We just can't say, well, I'm just going to forget about that because of that. You know, well, we, we do see it. a lot of that, though, Yeah. where we give it a negative connotation. Mm -hmm. And those who are beginners to the faith will avoid such things because... You know, yeah. they've been grown to think of. Yeah, gemstones. like crystals. Yeah. You know, uh, gemstones and stuff like that. We yeah. automatically, you know, think that, well, that's something Even wicked letters, or whatever. But, yeah. you know, we see here where it talks about how um, the angels were covered in these. Yeah. Right. All right, so let's go on to verse six. Verse six. And the host of heaven were standing before him on his right hand and on his left. And Satan was standing by them. But behind them. Yeah. So Satan is usually there. When he's, Always. <laughs> yeah, angels show up. You know, he's usually there looking around. Remember, he um, once was part of the group. Right. So he's part of the heavenly court in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the Zohar also mentions this. But what about the biblical reference? Job 1 and 6 describes a similar scene where the sons of God present themselves with Satan among them. And Satan's placement behind the heavenly host indicates a subordinate role. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Satan showed up as well to um, make accusations. I'm say he was walking to and fro the earth. Right. Looking for somebody who can ruin their life. Something like that. <laughs> All right. Verse 7. And then a man dressed in linen brought before the glory of the Lord three books that contain the records of every man. Now, here's the significance of Gad the Seer. You don't really hear about these three books. Mm -hmm. You hear about the Book of Life. Yeah. Um, and you can imagine the Book of the Wicked, but it's this book of unintentional sins that we, we really need to know about. Right. You know, that's the important part of these 10 days of awe. We all come in as sinners or in the Book of the Wicked. Mm -hmm. And then during these 10 days, we can make a transformation if we do it right. Right. Mm -hmm. well, the biblical reference talks about this concept parallels the book of life in Revelation 20 and 12, where individual deeds are recorded and judged. And that's the one that we um, are most familiar with, the book yeah, of life. Right, in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. Right, but it's talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just that those guys get to go away, you know, in security. While the rest of us have to struggle a little bit. Mm -hmm. Both of these books talk about the record keeping. You know, Gad our records. Seer and the keys of Enoch. Yeah, our, our records are, they're keeping, rec they're keeping records of our deeds. Right. But, and that's important to understand when it comes to atonement because that's where our deeds are being um, reconciled. Mm -hmm. Now, some that's going to choke on that a little bit because you remember we get 
cleansed during Passover. That's where our garments are made white again. Mm-hmm. But remember, we still have to make restitution. Mm-hmm. We still have to make atonement. Mm-hmm. So that's why you have atonement day. So you can imagine you could have purification without atonement. Mm-hmm. Or purification without retribution. Or you could have retribution without purification. So that's why they're on opposite ends of the year. But let's go on to verse 8. And he read the first book, and it contained the just deeds of his people. And the Lord said, these are granted eternal life. The first book represents the records of the righteous. Now, you also remember this from the shepherd of Hermes. Mm -hmm. And how those who are green, who turned in their rods green, were allowed to go into the tower immediately. Well, those would be these who are righteous, mm-hmm. right? And then you also remember that there was rods who never got corrected. Right. Those would be the wicked. And then there was those who changed. Well, mm-hmm. and there was those who changed and became wicked. Mm-hmm. And then there was those who changed and became good, became right. green. So that's these 10 days. And you notice how all of this is intertwined in all of these books. Mm-hmm. Here a little, there a little. The righteous deeds leads to eternal life and this is talked about in matthew 25 and 34 then shall the king say unto them on his right hand come ye blessed of my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world so it's talking about those who inherit the earth yeah well in the previous verse it's talking about the sheep will be on the right hand the goats on the left and we know that that is talking about the righteous and the unrighteous And so it says that then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, which is the sheep, come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So it's just talking about the righteousness, um, which represents the sheep compared to the unrighteous, which represents the goats. Right. And the thing about it, we learn back in the Bible that one of them goes out into the wilderness, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, let's, let's, let's see what Gad has to say. Verse 9. And Satan said, Who are these guilty people? And the man dressed in linen cried to Satan like a ram's horn, saying, Silence, this day is holy to our Lord. Okay, so you, that's why Satan is there to bring these accusations. Mm-hmm. He's, he's the slanderer, and his job is to remind our father our, that... We ain't supposed to go to the kingdom. We're not worthy. We can't go. Mm-hmm. Biblical reference is similar to Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, where Satan accused Joshua, the high priest. This verse reflects the adversarial role of Satan in questioning the righteous, just like you say, and being the accuser mm-hmm. of um, the brethren. Yeah. Anytime we try to do something good. Yeah. yeah he stands in the way. Mm-hmm. So that's the importance of offerings and that kind of thing. Right. It, it would even, you know, it, it's covering things behind the scenes, but, you know, it can also cover things that you're thinking about if you think you may be unworthy. Mm-hmm. And so it's probably why, you know, offerings and stuff is a part of all of this. But let's go on to verse two. And he read the second book and it contained the unintentional sins of his people. And the Lord said, put that book aside, but save it until one third of the month passes by to see what they will do. OK, so now here you have. The 10 days, because it's talking about a third of the month. And if a month is 29.54 days long, you start off on the memorial blowing the trumpets as your first day of atoning. You're blowing the trumpets, but you're also atoning. And then you go through the next 10 days, counting the first day as day one. All right, so let's go on to verse 11. And he read the third book, and it contained the wicked deeds of his people. So now these would be the people who did not do right over the 10 days. Okay, That's important to understand as far as we're concerned because we're given a chance to correct. Mm -hmm. But those who don't correct for whatever reason are these people here whose names will be written in this book. The Bible reflects this in Ezekiel 18, 30 through 32, where wicked deeds are subject to judgment and the need for repentance. Yeah, so this again is why we do charitable deeds. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. to wipe away some of those things. Yeah. All right, verse 12. And the Lord said unto Satan, These are your share. Take them and do what you want with them. So, just like we heard about the scapegoat going into the wilderness to be destroyed there, we have 
Satan taking these people whose names is found written in his book out mm-hmm. into the wilderness. Mm-hmm. Yep. So this is prophecy. And again, the Bible referenced this in Matthew 13 and 41, where it describes the Son of Man sending out angels to separate evil from the righteous, reflecting the delegation of judgment authority. So like you said, you have the wheat and the tares. Yeah. And then they have to be separated. Yeah, Satan given authority over the, the wicked things that we do. All right, verse 13. And Satan took the wicked to a wasteland to destroy them there. So now here we, you know, start adding or incorporating other biblical prophecies like the earthquake and the pole shift and all of this other stuff that goes on. We can understand how easy it's going to be mm-hmm. for a lot of people who don't have faith in our Father and His Word mm-hmm. who will be destroyed simply by attrition. Yeah. Simply by exposure to the elements and such. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the Bible reference this similar to Matthew twenty five, thirty one. Where the wicked are separated from the righteous and subject to the judgment that Satan has for them. This is the Holocaust that we're talking about, that we hear about in the end times, the all through our revelation. It's the Holocaust. All right, so let's look at verse 14. And the man dressed in linen cried like a ram torn, saying, Blessed are the people who know the joyful shout, O Lord, who walk in the light. Of your countenance. So again, you have this man dressed in linen here who is responsible for recording the information, right? That what we saw in verse 7? Yeah, he um, holds the book and he's the one that records the deeds of everybody. So these are the people that are left in because now you don't have a book of unintentional sins anymore. Mm-hmm. All of those people who are left are now written in the book of life. And that's, so that's why the man dressed in linen is cheering. Mm-hmm. Giving a joyful shout like we see in verse 15. Blessed are the people who know the joyful shout, O Lord, who walk in the light of your countenance. Yeah, so it's, it's important to understand that they walk in, in the light of his countenance, which in good times, you know, there were some who struggled with why we would do such a thing. But as we go into these hard times, these are the ones who are going to be blessed. Yeah, you know? signifying, um, as in the Psalms 44, 31, a close relationship with the Most High. Yeah. Walking in, you know, throughout Scripture, it talks about walking in His shadow. A state of living in alignment with divine truth and life. Mm-hmm. All right, let's go on to verse 16. And I heard the voice of the host of heaven rejoicing and saying, Master of justice, the Lord of hosts, the whole heaven and earth is full of your glory. Referencing the Celestials and how they are at play, too. Mm-hmm. You have the stars that are aligning. And as they are aligning, they're causing shifts within humanity. Okay. And so humanity is changing along with the stars. Mm-hmm. That's why it's important to keep that spiritual connection. And I was shocked by the vision since I did not know what the Lord had done for me. Amazement to these divine encounters. Mm-hmm. Biblical reference is seen in Daniel 10 and verse 7 says, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I restrained no strength. Just talking about the astonishment. I guess like being in the presence of the Father. Mm-hmm. Then one of the cherubims flew up to me and he put an olive leaf on my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched your mouth and your iniquity is taken away and your sin forgiven. So this leaf symbolizes purification and forgiveness. Somehow. Right. It says the olive leaf represents peace and reconciliation similar to the cleansing seen in Isaiah 6, 6 or 7. Acts of purification aligning with the olive leaf as a sign of divine forgiveness. Let's go on to verse 19. And this law that you have seen is a statue for Israel and a law of the God of Abraham and peace unto Isaac your father. Referencing the rainbow again. Mm -hmm. The divine statutes and the covenants for Israel will be coming back. Well, they are for them now, um, but those who are in this um, book of the unsure 
if I can call it that, they have the chance to pick up these covenants, to embrace these covenants too. Yeah. And that's really what it's all about. Like we read over in Malachi chapter 4, where it talks about you know, returning to the covenant. In the Bible, this verse underscores the divine law from Abraham to present, aligning with Genesis 17 and 7, and the laws given to Israel. Yeah, that should be noted that it's not just the Mosaic covenant, mm -hmm. but the Abrahamic covenant as well, and the Noah. Uh, Hyatt covenant is going to come into the other Noahic covenant. Mm -hmm. um, they are all going to play into the, all of the covenants are real right. and still in play. The covenant of David, of course, is our Messiah. But go ahead to verse 20. And the Lord will bless your people in the trial with everlasting peace. Yeah, so these 10 days of awe is what he's talking about. That's mm -hmm. just trial. Mm -hmm. You know, this purification because purification is not really easy all the time. You know, especially when we're really used to doing things a certain way and we have to change our ways. Mm -hmm. But we're given a period to do so. Prophetically, we're given 10 years to do so. Mm -hmm. right? But that period has already started, actually. Maybe we get closer to the end of it. So that's really why we need to pay really a close attention to these 10 days. Mm -hmm. right? Just in case we've missed something over the years, we try to make up for it with our obedience. Right. Biblical reference is Jeremiah. 29 11 where God promises a, a future filled with hope and peace. I believe it says where well, the father tells Jeremiah I know the thoughts, I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to give you a future and a peace and hope. So this is all wrapped up in the promise of peace and blessings that he has for us. We just have to understand we got to go do this first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alright verse 21. And I said amen May the Lord our God do this for us forever and ever. All right, so we have agreement here. Mm -hmm. Everybody's on the same page. Right. Similar to what we saw in Deuteronomy 27. Yeah, 15 through 26. And the last verse, I believe. And the angels yeah. answered, Amen and Amen. Once again, underscoring um, the agreement. Yeah. So we have these 10 days of all. Yeah. And like we started off talking about in the beginning of this video, not Many people are aware of these, even though they're aware of the memorial blowing the trumpets and are aware of atonement day. These 10 days of awe are extremely important. You may be actually missing out a lot on the atonement day when you don't actually participate in these 10 days of awe. Right. I mean, you, you go through the reflection part. Um, remembering the wrongs that you've done and how much repentance you need mm -hmm. and then on atonement day you make atonement for that which you have been reflected on for the last nine days right. all right so we wanted to share that with you guys hopefully you got something out of this video if you did please hit the like button if you didn't hit the dislike button but please leave us a comment either way and we thank you guys so much for um stopping by coaching the bike that shop purchasing clocks um also, yeah, we have lots of downloads, lots yeah. of information, right. um, calendar, and yeah, lots lot of free, free yeah, a lot of free um, good stuff that um, you can use to take you into these um, upcoming pieces. Well, we'll work on that. In the meantime, I'll see you in the comment section. Follow on my